Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I think um, hopefully people will be filtering in, but please feel free. Everybody's, I think, afraid of these pillows here, so please come sit down, enjoy, get comfortable. It'll be a much better panel if everybody's sort of uh, feeling rested and, and present. Um, I have some slides just really quickly, um, if, if we wouldn't mind putting those up. Uh, just to set some context for this discussion, um, I'm from, uh, uh, my name is Dylan Hendricks, and I'm from the Institute for the Future, which is a nonprofit independent research organization based in Palo Alto, California. And we do sort of futures forecasting, looking at particularly things like the future of work and looking at some of the structural changes that we're seeing now uh, that sort of give us a sense of some plausible scenarios of the future of where we could be headed. So really quickly, I wanted to just share with you sort of a cheat sheet that uh, I've been using recently of kind of five apps and platforms that I think sort of really clearly demonstrate some of the, the breadth of the change that we're experiencing um, and, and where it might be going and some areas where it actually is sort of moving faster and sort of more forcefully than, than we might imagine. I think just sort of looking at our, our sort of normal work lives on the edges of uh, this sort of peripheral, we're seeing a lot of change. And this is intentionally provocative to sort of set a, set a space for what, what is really sort of the, what's possible sort of looking 10, 15 years out in terms of the nature of work. So a lot of this revolves around looking at sort of um, the changing structural nature of how we interact. One of the things that we talk about a lot at the Institute for the Future is that organizations themselves, businesses themselves, are a technology, and that that technology is being disrupted as much as anything else. So the ability to coordinate groups of people to do work um, in, in very efficient ways, as we're going to talk about a little later, is creating sort of new opportunities, but also a lot of new challenges in terms of the ways that we even think about how do we organize ourselves around sort of workers' rights? How do we organize uh, ourselves around the changing nature and implementation of the social contract. And so that's what we want to get into in the conversation. Um, but just to sort of walk you through some of these five platforms, and I invite you to, you know, these are the ones that I, I sort of pull my phone out and show people to give them a sense of, of how far we're going. So the first one that I want to talk about is CamFind. And CamFind is a free app that you can download on your phone. Uh, it's free to download, free to use. Uh, and you take your phone out, and you can use this, the camera on your smartphone to take a picture of really anything in the world around you. And within a few seconds, that app will then identify, it sort of does kind of like a Terminator vision unscrambling of words, and then it, it tells you exactly what that object is. And this interface is sort of suggesting to you, because it only takes a few seconds, that there's some kind of machine learning, machine vision happening on the phone that is identifying the object in front of you. What's really interesting about CamFind, and I think sort of telling in terms of really the sort of really incredibly dramatic reduction in transaction costs to coordinate people, something that we used to rely on organizations explicitly for, how fast that's dropping. What CamFind is actually doing is it's actually very quietly and invisible to the user sending your photo very quickly to somebody in the Philippines. Uh, they have a group of people working in the Philippines or, or other places in the world. That person's receiving your photo. Very quickly, a human being is identifying what it is and then sending it back. And again, it doesn't cost anything to the user to do this. Um, and they're setting up sort of a model where eventually they want to have the sort of go-to API for recognizing images. Eventually, they will be able to automate this. But in the meantime, just the idea that sort of interacting with an international business relationship is so simple and cheap that they don't even tell you that's what's happening, right? So let's just give you a sense of when we're looking for workers, when workers are looking for work, this is sort of the baseline affordance of these new systems. So, what this leads us to is sort of, you know, if, if we can connect with people all across the world in productive ways, sort of engage in contracts and facilitate those contracts in a matter of seconds, that kind of uh, hyper-connectivity, where does that lead us to in terms of the sort of necessity of our existing uh, institutions, right? And so uh, WeChat is the second one that I want to talk about. WeChat is the, the major messaging platform in China. It's sort of an alternative to any other kind of, you know, Snapchat or Facebook Messenger, any of these kinds of things. Um, it started just about five years ago with just the ambition of people being able to send messages to each other. But because China, uh, as a government and as a society, has the ability to leverage whatever services on the network that they want to and that they can, right? They don't have sort of the, to sort of negotiate the sort of regulatory framework, they just decide that just in a matter of four years, WeChat has become the life operating platform for millions of people in China. So in the largest cities in China, people are using WeChat to do everything that used to exist in sort of a siloed institution, right? Something that for centuries has existed in its own institution like the hospital or like the police. Um, now these are all just through WeChat. So people use it to uh, book their doctor's appointments, to 
interact with their health data, to borrow money, to get hotels and taxis, to report uh, fines or report incidents to the police, to pay their fines, sort of all of these different things, th this messaging app, you know, and this gives you a sense of the scale and speed of this change, that the sort of the interface for the smart city has just sort of ended up in a messaging app, right? It's just sort of an arbitrary place for it to go because of this, these in incredible affordances which have emerged in just the last few years. Um, so uh, the third one I want to talk about is Upwork. So, uh, Upwork is not Hopwork, so our friend Vincent, who's going to be speaking, is from Hopwork, and they had the name first. It's very important that people know that. Um, Upwork is the largest micro-working site in the world right now, and uh, I think there's very important and interesting distinctions between it and Hopwork, which we're going to get into, but they're very much aimed at sort of lowest common denominator, right, sort of very low cost, being able to hire anybody to do anything, essentially, and most of this work is coming from sort of being demanded in economies that have money to pay and then being taken by micro-workers in places, again, like the Philippines, uh, where they can work for very little money. Uh, what's interesting about this model is they have uh, uh, billions of dollars being transacted on this platform already uh, of work being conducted. And in terms of skilling workers, so this is the, the place that I want to get into, is uh, in this age where the skills that are required in order to do the work that's demanded, there's, at least in America where I'm coming from, um, from Canada originally, so don't hold that against me, but living in America, uh, that the, there's an incredible skills gap in terms of the jobs that people need done and the skills that are being taught in the schools, and how do we, how do we close this gap, right? So Upwork's solution is rather than negotiating the different kinds of degrees and certifications that people have from whatever schools or universities that they're graduating from all over the world, they've just created their own proprietary certification platform. So they know what skills are in demand from what jobs people are posting, and then they know what sort of existing skills their workers have, and they create their own testing, which their workers go through, and then create, in addition to sort of the reputation scores that they're keeping track of, uh, they create these sort of resumes for their workers that have the sort of certifications that they've created, right? So it's a, a very tight feedback loop for them, and it's very uh, affordable for the workers to participate in this, and yet it creates this situation where, as it scales, Upwork is now sort of accidentally holding the certification of millions of workers, right? So if workers want to go somewhere else to work, they can't necessarily bring that with them. So, the, you know, again, as we scale these and the speed of these systems very quickly, we create all of these sort of social problems that are not being addressed within these platforms. Uh, number four is GitHub. So GitHub is the most popular coding platform in the world. I'm sure everybody here is, is familiar with it, uh, given the WeShare audience. Um, and one of the interesting things about GitHub is obviously they're sort of on a leading edge in terms of uh, sort of, you know, coding and being very involved in the digital economy in a very direct uh, and foundational way. But I think what's really interesting about it in terms of sort of a signal of where we might be going with all of this in terms of workers and how they find work, how they demonstrate their capability, is that rather than sort of showing people's work through, again, sort of their certifications or, uh, or something else, uh, GitHub instead just provides a real-time dashboard uh, of very high-resolution data of everything that a coder has ever contributed to the site, right? Where they've contributed code, what kind of code they contributed, what skills they uh, employed, how that work was received, really more information than we've ever had about what a worker is good at um, with the least amount of manual effort required to collect it and to coordinate it, right? So thinking about sort of moving away from these very sort of low resolution models of identity and certification that we've had to much higher resolution in the future. And then the fifth one that I want to introduce is, is a little bit more speculative, but I think particularly for this audience, maybe will not feel that way. This is a, a, a startup called Spacious, which is based out of the U.S., and Spacious is sort of taking the kind of co-working model and then adding sort of an Airbnb model on top of it and really recognizing that, again, because of these incredibly low, like sort of almost approaching zero transaction costs to coordinate incredibly sophisticated contracts, even without the blockchain, right? The blockchain is sort of moving that in another direction. Um, but already we have this ability to do this basically for free. So in the same way that people are now increasingly working from home because their work is more portable and is sort of mediated through digital platforms, we're getting to the point where people can live from work as well, right? The actual sort of context of what a space is for um, becomes increasingly sort of up for grabs in this world that we're uh, entering into. So uh, Spacious is an example. You can see in that sort of, it's, it's hard to see necessarily, but that yellow diagram shows that what they're looking for is just infrastructure, physical infrastructure, that has a series of rooms in it, and then they can design those rooms to change context 
context on a moment's notice in the same way that maybe the micro workers and freelancers that they're working with are changing context very quickly. And you can rent a room by the hour, by the day, however much you need it for. And you can use it either for working or for sleeping or for recreating. So you can imagine this scenario where maybe people aren't even just as sort of these emergent teams, as sort of the Inspiral type networks are sort of forming teams that they wouldn't even necessarily need to sort of rent an apartment, that they would just sort of follow the team where the work goes and at the end of that day, use one of these on-demand platforms to rent the room beside where they're working and then move on somewhere else, right? So this even gets to the idea of what do we, what, what do we have zoning for? Why do we need to specifically identify a, a, a physical environment for just one purpose instead of letting people uh, sort of adapt that purpose within the context of what they're doing? So that's just sort of a, a high-level overview, a lot of sort of dense information, but trying to set sort of a provocative sphere for really the under, underlying fundamental change that we're experiencing in work, which uh, we believe is very profound, um, and there's a lot of nuances to talk about it. So uh, that's where I want to pivot to our panel. So again, uh, we're uh, honored to be joined by Sarita Gupta with Jobs with Justice and Vincent Uget from uh, Hopwork. And uh, I want to just start by allowing them to introduce themselves and speak a little bit about the work that they're doing. This on? Okay. Hello? You can hear me? Good. Good. Um, first of all, thank you so much, and it's amazing to be here, and thank you for uh, setting all that up, Dylan. Uh, my name is Sarita Gupta. I'm the executive director of an organization called Jobs with Justice, um, based in the United States, and our organization is a network. Um, we're a network of local coalitions across the country uh, that bring together worker organizations, trade unions, uh, community-based NGOs, uh, student organizations, faith-based groups to uh, protect and advance the rights of working women and men in our economy. Um, and we do a lot of campaigns. We do this through campaigning as well as through public discourse work, um, bringing the real life examples and stories of working people into important conversations like this. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm Vincent Huguet, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hopwork. We are a Paris-based company. We started three years ago. Uh, we're only operating in France for the moment, and that's a choice. We are really uh, going uh, step by step, country by country, because we really want to have a, a local approach. Uh, we know that work can be done from everywhere, but we still think that it's important to, uh, to be close to each other. Uh, so we're basically a platform of freelancers, freelancers of the creative class, or so they are developers, graphic designers, uh, people in communication, marketing. Uh, and we are connecting them with uh, companies, uh, about uh, 10,000 companies now, from the smallest company to the big ones uh, here in France. And more than the platform, we also think ourselves as a community or a cooperative of freelancers. Uh, there are now 22,000 freelancers on the platform, about 2,000 each month uh, join the platform. And these are people who already were freelancers. Uh, they are already had work, they already had clients, but they come to us because they see the value of the platform. They see it because uh, they gain new customers. Uh, we help them with the payments, which is a problem always with uh, freelancers, and we assure them a, a payment uh, 48 hours after the, the end of the contract. And we help them also with uh, a lot of things such as uh, insurance, uh, um, that they, as alone, as you mentioned, uh, alone, the, it will it will be difficult for them to uh, to have a good uh, good support, good benefits, and together we can do uh, better things. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that we want to talk about, I think, here today is that as our old stories for how uh, sort of employment plays in our lives and, and what sort of the value sort of proposition is in terms of the entire system of work, that's really sort of deconstructing in a lot of different ways and, and slightly differently in different places. Um, and so I wanted to sort of set us up to talk about what are the sort of the dichotomies where the conversation becomes very sort of binary, right? Where there's a lot of these conversations where it sort of is framed as sort of technological innovation versus sort of uh, traditional workers' rights or uh, the sort of this binary between an individual freelancer that is, and especially in the U.S., and I think we'll get into the nuances of how that's different with Hopwork, but in the U.S., the individual freelancer movement with things like Uber, it's very much taking all of the liability and putting it onto the individual and taking all of the risk and putting it onto the individual 
as opposed to full-time employment where the individual is contained entirely within sort of an organizational framework. So these are sort of uh, you know, very far apart binaries and maybe not necessarily uh, useful for thinking about how do we productively move forward sort of integrating these technologies with sort of the, the changing needs and the existing needs of, of, of workers as the social contract, which is you know, mentioned several times throughout this event, is an invisible document, right? Is, is also being sort of invisibly violated. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of ask you, Sarita, just to start, um, who who's, stands to benefit the least in the short term from these kinds of innovations, right? Who are the vulnerable um, that are going to be impacted perhaps negatively, either because their industries will be the last to see the sort of benefits of these, or because they just don't have access for other reasons? What, I think that's what's so interesting in this moment. And, and again, in, in a US context, what we're seeing, um, I do want to take a step back for a second, if yeah, that's OK, and just say, in the United States right now, we are seeing an immense growth of what we call contingent work, so part-time and temporary and subcontracted work. And there's a way in which people are talking about the on-demand economy or the gig economy um, and, and really referencing some of the dichotomies you're talking about and, and really how, how much people are struggling to survive in the economy today. But what's interesting at this moment is that the experience of working people uh, in the so-called gig economy is really the experience of the working poor for centuries in the United States and around the world, right? It is not a new thing to have to piecemeal work and ensure that you have um, uh, reliable work, out enough hours of work to support yourself, sustain yourself and your families. Um, but now what's happening in the US is it's actually a coming, it's becoming a reality across the economy. So there's actually multiple sets of working men and women who will be impacted if we don't figure out how to bring them into the conversation sooner. Um, there's certainly uh, workers who are in industries that are rapidly shifting, right? And then there's a whole set of uh, low wage workers, largely in the US being women, growing numbers of women, people of color, immigrant workers who um, really will be impacted if they're not brought into the conversation soon about how these different uh, parts of our economy are being shaped. Um, and I just want to say that, again, it's a third of our workforce. That is huge in the United States that is going through this. And some of the questions that's really surfacing for us is what is the social contract that needs to exist today given the changing nature of work? Um, how do we figure out how workers have flexibility because people need flexibility in their lives. They're caring for loved ones. They need to take care of themselves. They want to go pursue an education. Whatever the issue, whatever the reasons are, people need flexibility, but they also need reliability of work. So how do we ensure reliability of work for, for working women and men? Um, and then how do we really speak to the hopes and aspirations of working men and women? There's a way in which they can be treated in these conversations like they don't exist. Mm -hmm. But we all know in this room that they have hopes and aspirations themselves. And how are we able to tap into that to be able to be as creative as possible to shape the future of work. Nice, thank you. And, and so I, I know that the situation is a little bit different, obviously in France and in Europe and um, being from Canada as well. The, once you have something like universal health care, this, this conversation can change a little bit. But I know that in particular, uh, there's a, a very sort of virtuous feedback loop that you're trying to create with Hopwork. Um, in terms of trying to get away from sort of maybe the upwork model where there's sort of this race to the bottom in terms of sort of less rights for workers because they have no leverage. Um, so do you want to speak just a little bit to what, what, what are you trying to do with Hopwork in terms of that sort of your piece of the social contract with workers? Yeah, I think it's true that to say that there is a polariz maybe a polarization these days uh, between uh, low-skilled workers and high-skilled workers. Our freelancers are lucky enough to be uh, highly skilled workers. Um, and ninety percent of them chose to be freelancers. Uh, they had a traditional work as an employee, and they, ch they chose to be freelancers. And really few of them, four percent, want really to go back to the traditional work. They are really happy like that. <coughs> and I think that a uh, platform like us uh, 
helps uh, help people uh, really you, you mentioned the universal healthcare uh, this is very important I think uh, independent work is not as developed here in France as it is in the US and it could be much more developed because at least as an independent worker you have the basic rights to health so this is already something uh, which is I think uh, quite important um, but then I think there's a role also in the platform uh, to give uh, services and, and, and benefits uh, to the workers. So that's what we are trying to do. Uh, the first thing is uh, one basic thing, we get them customers, but this is easy to say, but uh, we, we also get, uh, give them access to uh, large customers. As a freelancer, you can't go to a Fortune 500 company alone. Together, uh, when we go to the purchasing de department and we represent uh, 22,000 freelancers, it's much easier, easier. Then it's much easier also to negotiate and bargain about the, the problems of payments. There's a campaign these days for, with the freelancer union in the United States, which is called Freelance Isn't Free, because there's this problem everywhere that uh, uh, Payments delays can be 60 days, 90 days, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And, and so I think platforms have a role here to put, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, the judge between the, the customers and, and the freelancers. And as I said before, we have also uh, we are actively looking into benefits. Uh, one thing we, we we did with AXA, an insurance company, uh, is that we have a liability insurance that covers all contracts through the platforms, and we're working is also in disability insurance, which is usually the problem that freelancers have here. They have health insurance, but if they have an accident, well, they, they don't have any revenues for, for years. So we're actively working in that, and we're even thinking of how we can make the, the best contributors in the platform become uh, kind of stockholders of the company. So um, uh, we think, uh, and this also is in, uh, our basic interest, uh, if we want to have the best freelancers, if we want them to join us, we have to give them uh, uh, good options, good benefits, uh, good services, and that's what we're trying to do to have uh, the best community, which is what our customers, the companies, are looking for. That's great. So what you're really doing is you're sort of, sort of rather than, than you know, talking about it, you're sort of enacting a new feedback loop uh, for these workers to enter into that sort of provides these benefits. Um, and I'm wondering, Sarita, we, we talked a little bit about some, like, what, what are models in the U.S. that you're seeing or in other places that, that are starting to, you know, nobody's sort of cracked the nut entirely, but that you think are sort of good uh, sort of precedents for creating these new kinds of feedback loops? Yeah, that's great. And it's so exciting to hear about the work that you're doing, Vincent. And um, just to say, uh, where I see and have been uh, personally involved in seeing this kind of a feedback loop has been in the growing care economy in the United States. Um, in the US right now, we're a rapidly aging nation. Uh, every eight seconds, someone turns 65 in the US, and people are living longer lives. So the, the need for elder care, as well as the need for child care is growing. Uh, and as you so aptly pointed out, we don't have the kinds of social benefits that uh, many countries in Europe have, unfortunately, um, which means we have to address that. So one of the platforms that's out there in the US is called care.com. Um, and care.com's platform really works to match up consumers, you know, families, individuals, like all of us in this room, who may need a babysitter, may need a child care provider, may need an elder care provider, um, and play a role and matching them up with a worker. Um, and so a few years ago, working with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, who represents a lot of these private market um, home care workers, uh, basically sat with care.com and said, how can we work together to actually lift up the labor standards for this workforce. In the United States, this is the one workforce that's been excluded from every single federal labor law. And it's a result of a legacy of racism in the United States. These were once considered slave jobs. So the, these workers have no right to any kind of collective bargaining. They don't have a right to minimum wage or overtime protections in the United States. So part of what we did is we sat with care.com and said, how can you as a platform actually raise the wages for workers on this platform together and how can we work in the care across the care sector and get other businesses on we created what was called a fair care pledge having consumers take a pledge that they will pay workers well provide holidays um, and and then what we did is essentially work with them because the company realized they were having a turnover of the workforce that was not good for their business model either and together now we also realized from 
the workers that many consumers don't know how to pay taxes for the workers or some of the basic consumer um, end needs. If you want to be a good consumer and support your workers that you've hired, they don't know how to do that. And so we were able to work with Care.com to create a whole portfolio of supports for consumers to do the right thing, as well as to raise the labor standards for the workforce. And together, we continue to work together to really make visible the care economy in the United States um, and make these sustainable, family-supporting uh, jobs and meet the needs of more families that are affordable and accessible for more families in the United States. So that would be an example of the kinds of collaborations that we're seeing in one sector, which is one of the fastest growing sectors in the U.S. right now. Yeah, that's great. So that makes me think sort of this, this larger conversation. Um, I know so there's been strikes in Paris this last week, uh, in the last few weeks around sort of uh, workers' rights as well. And, um, and, and a lot of these sort of look like kind of traditional forms of protest and, and forms of negotiation and, and potentially play into those dichotomies of sort of the worker versus the organization. Um, and I know in, in the U.S. there's sort of there's some different models that have emerged. I mean, it's it's all sort of a, move, a very quickly moving space. Uh, Uber has been sort of out of necessity having to sort of negotiate on a city by city basis uh, with different cities, and just recently negotiated with uh, Uber drivers in uh, New York City, um, where the, it's been this sort of. Uh, battle over whether or not these Uber drivers are going to be individual contractors with no rights or full-time employees with full rights but with sort of heavy liabilities for the company. Um, does anybody really want that dichotomy? And, and so what they've done instead is they've negotiated a kind of a guild system on top of the existing union framework. So there's sort of this guild that, that it's sort of somewhere in the middle. And it makes me think that between these, uh, these dichotomies, everything that's interesting is, is in the middle, right? And, and, and sort of blurring. So I, I kind of want to just put it out there as sort of a large question, but the, the sort of future of the labor movement, I mean, what does that look like? What's the right scale for us to be thinking about solving these problems? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll just say, I think it's a really exciting time in the, in the labor movement because we are back to a moment of just immense experimentation of what are the right forms of workers coming together. Um, they will not, in every sector, it will not make sense that they look like the traditional labor union model as we have known and seen. Um, in some cases, it may be very different times, like, like a guild or a different kind of worker organization. Um, but I, I think there's tremendous experimentation. In the US, about 20 years ago, there was a set of what's called worker centers that formed out of necessity, out of uh, immigrant communities and communities of color, mostly poor communities in the US, who are saying many of workers are uh, working in construction as day laborers, going to corners, trying to get jobs, um, but they have no protections in place at all. How do we address this? And began organizing as day laborers into a worker center center model. Restaurant workers are doing that now. As I mentioned, domestic workers. There's agricultural workers who also in the US don't have any labor protections under the law. So we have seen the beginnings of these worker centers. And frankly, we're just in a moment when worker centers and unions are trying to work together to birth a whole new process and system. <clears throat> and I will say we think that's really important because our experience is, and this is another dichotomy that gets raised a lot, is mm -hmm. it individual rights versus collective rights? Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is, of course, individuals need to have rights on the job. They need access to trainings and um, skills building and whatnot. But we also know that it's impossible for workers on their own to be able to negotiate for what those needs are. And actually, it's healthier for sectors of workers to come together and shape and work with companies in the way that I described with care, um, and in, it sounds like in, in, your, in your context, freelancers, being able to really think through how you can both ensure commercial benefits, but also ensure social benefits that make sense. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it's an exciting time. Lots, mm -hmm. I don't know where it's headed, but lots of experiments are underway. Yeah, I think it's a complicated but very interesting time because uh, not so long ago, you were an independent worker all your life. You were a doctor and you chose to be that and you were doing your career as a doctor or you were a worker for a big company and you stayed there. And now we, what we're seeing is that people will do uh, one time a freelancer, one time employee and then they will maybe do the two at the same time. So I think that unions have to reinvent themselves but also the states 
which uh, have based a lot of things in taxes uh, on work, uh, have been uh, um, have to reinvent uh, how they are how they are dealing with that. Uh, they have to give us a way, a portable way, of uh, taking our benefits from being an employee to being uh, a freelancer. So uh, uh, there's a lot of work on, about that, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another one for, for you, Vincent. So uh, in addition to rights, there's sort of another aspect to this sort of deconstruction of the traditional centralized institution as we move more towards platforms um, that we talked about a little bit before uh, around sort of the, the kind of social cohesion aspect, right, of sort of that jobs are, are a way of means of gaining an income. They're a form of benefit sort of distribution, but they're also sort of a, a big part of our identity and a big part of our community, right, this sort of idea of having coworkers and a common cause. And, and there's uh, examples of sort of emergent groups that are working on similar projects that sort of maintain that, like in the sort of Inspiral model. But then on something like Hopwork, there's uh, sort of a lot of individuals that are not necessarily ever working on projects together, but they exist in a similar context. And how do you sort of uh, reintroduce that kind of social cohesion, that idea of not just sort of having a, seri you know, a, a group of people that are all individuals? Yeah, this is funny because we, we, we talk a lot with our community and, and, and we ask them what they need. Uh, and of course, they need customers. Of course, they need a uh, security of payments. But another thing they told us is that they feel sometimes isolated. Uh, how's is that the right way? Yes. Yeah. Alone. So uh, they need to group uh, themselves sometimes. So one way is the co-working, of course. But in the co-working, you don't necessarily have people who, who work on the same things, etc. And what we do is that um, we have, and that came from the community, we have a uh, hub drinks happening uh, in most big cities of France, where our freelancers uh, gathers with other freelancers, and of course we publish that on the site so everybody can know it, and they can share their, their fears, they can share their success, they can share uh, um, what they want about the community. And I think this is very important because, as we mentioned, if you have the possibility the, to, to, to group yourself, uh, you can be uh, stronger, so they can be stronger uh, uh, in what they have to tell us, but w they can be stronger in freelancers uh, as a whole, so this is important. Yeah. So we've got 10 minutes left. I, I want to try a big question, because we're at WeShare, and, and so we'll see if that works, and then I want to try a sort of a practical one towards the end. Um, so in terms of the big question, one of the things that I think has been coming up through over the last couple of days as I've been at different sessions, there's been a lot of talk about you know, we, we can identify a lot of forms of work that are being intermediated at sort of a global level, right? There's really no sort of national framework for some of these sort of media, like inter, uh, disintermediation uh, platforms. And then there's obviously issues that are happening at sort of the hyper-local level, right? And which is most issues. Um, so where do you see, you know, and, and not to sort of put you on the spot, but w what is the right level or right scale to be thinking about uh, interventions and policies and, and even platforms for sort of coordinating the future of work as we sort of, you know, get into this very interesting kind of post-institutional, perhaps post-national landscape. What, what, is, what does that look like for you? What do you think about when you think about the future of work in that way and, and the scale at which we're going to have to sort of interact with it? I mean, I certainly think about it at all the different levels. I mean, at Jobs of Justice, much of the work we're doing is looking at what are the interventions we can make, whether it's through policy or through the organizing itself, um, uh, or the discourse work at the local, like within local labor markets, uh, so very local, to uh, across industries, where it makes sense within industries that we're thinking through these questions, and then along the global supply chain mm -hmm. is the other where, um, arena in which we pay attention. And that was born for us out of years of organizing and campaigning we were doing around Walmart. Um, and it really took us understanding it's a global company and that you really have to, and there's so many issues and so many people impacted around the world, how do we begin to build the kinds of relationships, partnerships, and solutions together? So I think my orientation in general is we have to be thinking at all of those scales mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and really be thoughtful about the implications of every intervention we're making because uh, inevitably uh, one intervention in one city may feel and look very different in another or one industry may look very different in another. And similarly at the global scale, um, one solution in one country might be very different based on the existing context for another country. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing that with the experience of 
big platforms like Airbnb. It's a different experience in Europe than the struggles that are going on in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And so being thoughtful about um, how we build movements together that can um, help us be thinking more expansively about the solutions we're pushing for. What I think is interesting is that um, the web has, gave us, has given us the availability to be connecting with workers from all over the world. And uh, we can connect. And actually, the first freelancers platform I've been uh, um, starting uh, by connecting, as you mentioned, uh, someone in the Philippines with someone in France and the US. And, and the web has always been at the beginning, you know, like e-commerce had to be lower cost than e-commerce itself. So uh, we were looking for the lowest price, and we were really don't care who, is, who are we, we are working with. It could be a machine, it could be someone just doing some small task. And I think it, it, this is very, really changing. We, we see a lot of models where local is important. And I think that is happening in work too. There's like a, a paradox where at the same time, remote working is uh, expanding, uh, even in all companies, I, I think. Um, but at the same time, we need to gather together. Uh, today we are here at the We Share Fest. Uh, we could do. Uh, we have people from all over the world. We could do that through the website and through the Facebook group of, uh, of We Share. But we still need to gather together. So what what we see uh, in our platform is that remote working is wa is is fine. Uh, near shore can be fine, but uh, freelancers and um, and and their customers have to meet each other. The the, the freelancers who are actually doing. Uh, the best on the platform uh, commercially is the ones who really, okay, they are working from their, from their home, they're working from their co-working office, but they still go and work with the customer. They still need to uh, uh, work uh, with a team. And I think this is important that this is uh, very human and, and very positive at the same time. Yeah, excellent. And it can build the social cohesion you're talking about, That's right? right? Like Absolutely. this understanding that we are connected. Um, and, and I think uh, given your original question on that, it's very important for people to feel that level of connection and community. So. Yeah, and I think like, care.com is probably doing some of that as well, right, as a sort of a byproduct. So, so maybe that this is the answer to my next question, but I'm curious, so you know, we've got a group of people here, and these are people that are sort of social innovators, people who are starting things, people who are talking to other people. So in terms of how, uh, trying to sort of course correct a little bit for some of our blind spots and, and where we're not paying attention to the, the people who are being left out or the people that, are, that need the, um, sort of to be a part of the conversation. If there is sort of one thing, and maybe the, you know, it's a, sort of a big ask, but what, what would you want people to think about? What's the you know, one lever or the one sort of framing that if you're going to be starting a company or if you're going to be starting a new initiative, like what do people need to really be sort of focused on in order to, at least in the short term, help us get to the next step of, of, of this transition? Um, well, I would say I'm going to go back to one of the dichotomies uh, mm -hmm. or your opening that you said that sometimes um, as a worker advocate, uh, we're seen as the people who are somehow opposed to technology and uh -huh. technological advances. And so what I would say is um, advanced technology in itself is not bad for working women and men, right? It's not bad if, in fact, it makes life easier on many levels. Um, but it's the actual application of uh, that matters, the application of that technology that matters. So how to be thoughtful about how your application, uh, your platform is uh, uh, friendly, uh, if it's meant to be, um, across uh, the economy, across diversities of people and experiences, and how do you maximize the opportunities for uh, in engagement and involvement um, in ways that don't leave people out, but also allow you to have a more creative product. So, uh, so I guess I, to think through the, re the application itself um, and, and who you're trying to reach and how I think matters a lot. And as, uh, as a broader community, I, I think it's in our interest to continue to think about the question of values and the social benefits. Uh, what's the, what are the values we're putting forth that are shaping um, the projects you're moving forward um, and, uh, and how do we ensure that those, uh, those values are, again, have real social benefits in addition to commercial benefits. So that would be something. Awesome. Thank you. So Vincent, so last question for you. So where, uh, sort of thinking broadly, 10 years, 15 years out, where, where, where would you like to see Hopwork be? Like, where, what is the future of work from the point of view of Hopwork? Is everybody working this way? And so what, what's your vision for that? What would you like to see? 
well, first I think that I'd like to say this, there's an obvious platformization of work, but it's still very new, so we don't know what's going to happen, but it's obvious that there's not going to be, uh, all the platforms are not going to be the same. We, sti we already uh, seeing that. There are like top-down approach where the platform defines the price and tells the workers what to do, when to do it. And there's bottom-up approach like Airbnb is, which is for me uh, more, uh, um, more fair. And I think it, it will be profitable to be fair. It will be uh, uh, commercially success. It can be commercially successful to be fair. So I hope that we'll uh, maintain it uh, uh, this way. Uh, I hope, of course, we'll be uh, expanding to other countries. And I'd love to uh, be talking with people from other countries uh, to have their approach about uh, freelancer work and, uh, and uh, maybe if we can do uh, things together. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I think that's it. We'll be uh, taking questions and answers in the terrace after this. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.